Luke chapter 20. Let's get right at it, huh? Luke chapter 20, and the title of our message this morning is Jesus is Examined. You'll, you'll see. Well, we have now come in our studies in the book of Luke to the final week of Jesus, to his, his earthly ministry, the week of the crucifixion. On Sunday, Palm Sunday, the first day of his last week, you remember Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem in what we call the triumphal entry, and he offered himself to the nation of Israel as their long-awaited Messiah, as their king. Multitudes of people lined the streets of Jerusalem crying out, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The religious leadership of Israel, you remember, told Jesus to make him stop. And he answered, he said to them, I tell you that if these, as these crowds of people, should keep silent, then the stones themselves would immediately cry out. And at that point, Jesus was officially rejected by the religious leadership of Israel. As the crowds, you remember, were rejoicing and celebrating, Jesus Christ our Lord was weeping for them because they had altogether missed the point. They thought that Jesus had come to set up the kingdom of God right then and right there, but Jesus came to die for their sins, for the sins of the entire world. He was going to be crucified. And Jesus knew that in a few short days, the same crowds that had been celebrating and had been crying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, would be crying, crucify him, crucify him. And Jesus knew of the destruction that would come upon them because they rejected him because they didn't know the day of their visitation, the day that God himself in human flesh visited them. And so as Jesus contemplated that fact that that Jerusalem would eventually be destroyed, he wept uncontrollably. That was Sunday, that was Palm Sunday. On Monday, the next day, he entered the temple there in Jerusalem and he threw out the money changers, those who sold sacrificial animals for a profit, taking advantage of the people's desire to worship God. Now, if Jesus had been the military Messiah uh, that the people wanted, Jesus would have brought an army into the city of Jerusalem to attack the Roman garrison at the Antonio Fortress, but instead Jesus came alone, weaponless, and he attacked a group of his own countrymen, religious charlatans who were profaning the temple there in Jerusalem. And you remember what he said, it is written, my house is a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. He was quoting both the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah. And then we're told at the end of chapter 19 that he was there teaching in the temple daily, And the people were very attentive in listening to him. Now that sets the stage for chapter 20. In chapter 20, the religious leadership of Israel questioned Jesus publicly. They scrutinized Jesus in order to get Jesus to say something publicly that would get him in hot water, either with the crowds of people or with the Roman government so that they might be able to bring criminal charges against Jesus in order to have him killed crucified. That's where we're at. It's now Tuesday, the day after Jesus cleansed the temple. The date is the 10th of Nisan on the Jewish calendar. On the 14th day is the Passover. That's when they sacrificed all the lambs. But it was during this time, the four days before the Passover, that the lambs were to be chosen by the families uh, and they were to be inspected, scrutinized over the next four days because these Passover lambs had to absolutely be without spot or blemish. And this is called out for us back in Exodus chapter 12, verse 3. Let me read a couple of verses from there. God told Moses, speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, on the tenth day of the month, that's what the day was here, every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb... Let him and his next door neighbor uh, take it to his house according to the number of those persons, according to each man's need, shall make your count for the lamb. And then in verse 5 of Exodus 12, it says, your lamb. You notice what happened? First it's a lamb, and then it's the lamb. Now it's your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the month. Then the entire assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. Jesus Christ, 
the spotless lamb of God for the next four days would be inspected by the religious leaders of Israel, scrutinized. And even though they were not able to find any fault, no spot, no blemish whatsoever, because he's absolutely without sin, they went ahead and crucified him on the day of the Passover. Jesus Christ, our Lord, became the Passover lamb, the one that all the others previously pointed to. Jesus Christ was killed by the whole congregation at twilight, exactly as Exodus 12, 6 says. Well, in the first 18 verses of chapter 20, they question Jesus' authority. Remember, Jesus is there. He's healing people. He's teaching people, even raising the dead. And no one could deny what he was doing openly because it was done in front of all. All they could do was to question his authority. And so that's what they do. Now, what happened, verse 1, on one of those days, as he taught the people in the temple and preached the gospel, that the chief priests and the scribes together with the elders confronted him. These priests, uh, this, these three entities here represented the religious authority in Israel at the time. The chief priests were the temple officials who happened to be in cahoots with the money changers, those that were there selling the doves, etc. And so Jesus was cutting into their profits. They were upset. The scribes were the teachers of the law and the elders were the political leaders of the nation. You could call it the Congress. Verse 2, they confronted him and spoke to him saying, tell us. And there's two questions. One, by what authority are you doing these things, claiming to be the Messiah, cleansing the temple, etc.? And, or who is he who gave you this authority? Now, they thought they had him trapped. If he says he's doing all of these things by his own authority, then the crowds of people would turn away from him, obviously. If he says he's doing this all by God's authority, claiming to be a king, then Rome would arrest him <coughs> for anarchy. But he answered and said to them, I will also ask you one thing. Though they asked him two things, he said, I will also ask you one thing and answer me. Now, that got my attention. When they asked him two things, by what authority you do these things and who gave you the authority, two distinct questions requiring two direct answers. Yet Jesus says, I will also ask you one thing. You see, for Jesus, both questions had the same answer. His authority was from God, and he is God. So I will ask you one thing. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? You know, was, was John the Baptist sent from God, or was he acting on his own authority? And they reasoned amongst themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, John's authority was from God, then he will say, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, all the people will stone us, for they are persuaded that John was a prophet. John had a huge following, you know. So they answered that they didn't know where it was from. They really played dumb here. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. They thought they had Jesus trapped, but he turned the tables on them, and now he's got them trapped. The truth is that had the religious leaders of Israel accepted John's authority, they would have had to accept uh, Jesus' authority because it came from the same place from God. In fact, John, you remember, eventually said, follow him. He's the one. And if they had been obedient to the revelation that God had already given them through John the Baptist, which you remember was repent and believe the gospel, then they would have had no trouble receiving the one that John the Baptist pointed to. So they wouldn't answer Jesus because doing so would trap them either way. And now Jesus gives them an indirect answer to their question, where did you get your authority? Then he began, verse 9, to tell the people this parable, a certain man planted a vineyard, leased it to vine dressers, and came or went into a far country for a long time. Now at vintage time, that's the harvest. He sent a servant to the vine dressers that they might give him some of the fruit of the vineyard, the, the owner's portion of the harvest. But the vine dressers beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent another servant, and they beat him, also treated him shamefully, and sent him away empty-handed. And again, he sent a third, and they wounded him and cast him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Uh, probably they will respect him when they see him. But when the vine dressers saw him, that's the owner's son, they reasoned amongst themselves saying, this is the heir. 
come and let us kill him that the inheritance may be ours. And so they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do to them? And then Jesus answers his own question in verse 16. He will come and destroy those vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. And when they, that is these crowds of people, remember it's not just the religious leadership, there's crowds of people there as well. When they heard it, they said, certainly not. You know, there's no way that the people would do something like that. Now in the parable, the nation of Israel is the vineyard. In fact, that's from the Old Testament. God called him his vineyard. The workers in the vineyard are the religious leadership of Israel who were supposed to be working in the vineyard, producing fruit amongst the people of God for the owner of the vineyard, which is God. The owner of the vineyard, of course, is God. He sent his prophets whom they beat and killed. You can read about it in the Old Testament. He sent other prophets. He did the same thing to them. So God sends his own son to them whom they crucify outside of the city of Jerusalem. John 1.1 says he came unto his own and his own did not receive him. That's exactly what happened. So he will come and destroy those vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. In Matthew's parallel account here, Jesus says, therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruit of it. And that's exactly what God did. Isaiah 5, 4 says, what more could have been done to my vineyard, speaking of Israel, than that which I've done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? So now the Lord has put his relationship with Israel on hold, so to speak. And he's using the church to do what Israel was supposed to do in the first place. But do not for a moment think that God is through with Israel. He is not. It's now the purpose of the church of Jesus Christ to be a witness to this world around us as to who God is, to share the good news of salvation with the world, to demonstrate the love of God to all. Jesus told his disciples, you are the light of the world. And that's what we're to do. And now God is looking for fruit from our lives, the fruit of the spirit, love and joy and peace and meekness, gentleness, patience, etc. But I wonder, as, as God comes to us, what does he find? Are there sweet or are there sour grapes, you see? Well, they said in verse 16, there's no way that the people would ever do a thing like that. So in verse 17, and he looked at them and he said, what then is this that's written? You know, why does it say this in the Old Testament? And now he quotes Psalm 118, verse 22. He says, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And then Jesus said, whoever falls on that stone, the chief cornerstone, which you and I know to be Jesus Christ, will be broken, but on whoever it falls, it'll grind him to powder. Again, the builders in this parable are the religious leaders of Israel who were to build up the people, a temple for God, not fleece them. But when the stone comes, the most important part of the temple, the Messiah himself, they reject him. Its number one application is to the nation of Israel who rejected Jesus Christ. He offered them the kingdom. They rejected the king and hence his kingdom. And then the kingdom of God will be offered to a nation uh, that's worthy of, of the fruit. Meaning the church. But when Jesus returns a second time at the end of the tribulation, God pours out his spirit on the nation of Israel. And then they will bear fruit the entire time for that thousand years, they will then be what God's always designed them to be during the millennium. They will be the ones leading the unbelieving nations to Christ like they should have done in the first place. So the number one application is to Israel. The second application is to the church made up of both believing Jews and Gentiles who after Israel rejected their Messiah, Jesus Christ, were given the opportunity and are now coming to Christ by faith, believing in him and Lord willing, bearing fruits the love and joy and peace, etc. Well, the options, there's only two of them. Either you fall upon Jesus Christ, who is the rock, and you're broken, meaning you repent, or you can have Jesus Christ fall on you in judgment. You might ask yourself where you stand on that question. But, but I believe this is as well a plea for them to repent. Remember, God's not willing that any should repent, but that all should come to repentance. And so as though he's saying, you don't have to do this. They were exposed to the light of John the Baptist, to the light of of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, but they refused to be enlightened. 
And it's almost as though when you look at this as a whole here, you want to know what, by what authority I'm doing these things and where I got the authority? Well, I'm the owner of the vineyard son. I'm the son of God, you see. Well, they questioned his, his authority in the first 18 verses. Now they question Jesus' integrity in verses 19 through 26. And the chief priests and the scribes, those are the teachers of the law, that very hour they sought to lay hands on him. And by the way, not to pray for him. But they feared the people, for they knew that he had spoken this parable against them. They definitely got the message. So they watched him. They kept their eyes on him. And they sent spies who pretended to be righteous so that they might seize on his words in order to deliver him to the power and authority of the governor, meaning Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor at the time. And they asked him, saying, Teacher, we know that you teach rightly. And you don't show personal favoritism, but you teach the way of God truly. They're buttering him up. And then here's their question in verse 22. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? This is a trap. If Jesus says, yes, it's lawful to pay taxes to Caesar, he would be at odds with the Jewish nation because they hated Rome. They hated paying tribute to Rome and the Jewish people would then turn away from him. If Jesus said, no, it's not lawful to pay taxes to Caesar, then he'd be at odds with the Roman government and could actually be executed by Rome. And they're thinking they've got Jesus over a barrel. You know, watch him squirm over this one. But he perceived their craftiness. He said to them, why do you test me? Show me a denarius whose image, whose head is on the coin and the inscription, whose name does it have? And they answered and they said, Caesar's. Both his picture and name were on the coin. And he said to them, render or give back therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And of course, these coins are made with Caesar's image on them. Therefore, they belong to him. Now, you do understand that you and I have been made in the image of God. We therefore belong to who? To God. Okay. But in doing so, Jesus recognizes two realms of authority. Human government, which is delegated. So we obey the laws, we pay taxes, we pray for our government, like the Bible tells us, and God's authority, which is absolutely supreme, and to whom we owe reverence and worship. We are citizens of the United States that carries with it certain responsibilities and privileges, but we are also at the same time a dual citizenship. We are citizens of heaven, which also carries with that certain responsibilities and privileges. And of course, the best citizens are the ones that honor their government because they worship the God who gave human government. Render under Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. But they could not catch him in his words, verse 26, in the presence of the people. And they marveled at his answer and notice, kept si keep silent. <laughs> That's what I would do. I mean, after a while, just shut up. You're not winning this thing, you know. What else could they say? They fell into the trap that they'd set for Jesus. The examiners had just become the examined. Now, the application to us is, obviously, we have a responsibility to God who made us. We worship him. We reverence him. We have a responsibility to human government, which makes our roads and protects us and provides services, etc. So they question Jesus' authority. They question Jesus' integrity. And now they question Jesus' theology. That's verses 27 through 38. Then some of the Sadducees who denied that there is a resurrection, came to him and asked him. Now, the Sadducees were the liberals. The Pharisees were the conservatives. But the liberals, these Sadducees, they held only the first five books of the Bible written by Moses, where they say there's no mention of the resurrection at all. They also denied the existence of angels. They came saying, verse 28, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man... A man's brother dies having a wife and dies without children. His brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. They actually quoted Deuteronomy chapter 25. And that's exactly what the law of Moses says. If you're married and then you die before you have any male offspring in order to, to carry on the family name, then by law, your unmarried brother had to marry your wife uh, after you died and the first male child they had would be considered yours in order to carry on your family name as well as the family property. And now they make up a story in order to make their point, and their point is there's no such thing as a resurrection. They want to make Jesus look foolish here. 
Now there are seven brothers. Verse 29. And the first took a wife and died without children. And the second took her as wife, and he died also childless. Then the third took her, and in like manner the seven also, and they left no children and died. You know, after the third or fourth, you'd be wondering, you know, what's wrong with this woman, you know? <laughs> her cooking, maybe, I don't know. But. And now all seven, seven husbands are dead. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, and they're just little laughing inside, you know, Whose wife does she become for all seven have had her? Now, being Sadducees, they thought that they were making fun of the resurrection, the physical body, uh, ludicrous, looking stupid. But it was another question for which they thought there was no good answer in order to make Jesus look stupid in order to disprove the resurrection. You know, like some have asked, you know, in a heart transplant, whose heart is it at death, you know? Or if you were buried on the prairie, you know, our bodies go back to the chemical elements in the ground. A cow eats the grass nourished by your body's elements, and then someone drinks milk from that cow, and your body's elements are now assimilated into that cow's body, into some other human body, you know, whose body do they belong to then, you know? And it's like, I mean, come on. I mean, God can do this. And Jesus answered and said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. Amen? That's, yeah. But those who are counted worthy to obtain the age, it's almost like he's looking at them going, you're not making it. <laughs> and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor can they die anymore, for they are equal to or as the angels and are the sons of God, being the sons of the resurrection. So once a believer dies and is raised again from the dead, they are now like the angels. They don't become angels, but they're like the angels. Now, according to the Bible, angels are created beings, but they don't die. And because they don't die, they don't need procreation to continue the race of angels because they don't die. Does that make sense? And that's what he's bringing up. They don't need to get married in order to reproduce. So, like, nice try, you know. And then, you know, just blew their whole little thing out of the water. Now, even Moses, Jesus goes on, verse 37. You know, the ones who, the one that you hold to, their right, Moses' writings, the first five books. Now, even Moses showed in the burning bush, bush passage that the dead are raised when he called the Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, who were dead at the time. <laughs> For he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Or all live unto him. In other words, they're not really dead. <laughs> they're alive, awaiting the resurrection with God. That's something just he just he just puts it together. You know, and if we didn't read this, you know, from the word of God out of the mouth of Jesus Christ Himself, you know, we'd never put it together either. But a simple statement like that, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. A simple state like, statement like that to Moses is an indication that they are alive, still alive. Well, Jesus had enough here, and beginning in verse 39, he examines them. Then some of the scribes answered and said, Teacher, you've spoken well. You know, the, the scribes were the conservatives. They loved <laughs> that he just put down the liberals. You know, now he got them fighting, you know. The... But after that, they did not ask a question. They're finally learning. <laughs> They had questioned Jesus' authority. They questioned Jesus' integrity. They had questioned Jesus' theology. And he passed the test with flying colors. The Lamb of God, he's passed the test. He's without spot or blemish. Blameless. And he said to them, how can they say that Christ, that is the Messiah, is David's son? So he brings up a question. How can they say that Christ is David's son. Now, David himself said in the book of Psalms, this is Psalm 110, verse 1. This is what David said, the Lord, which is Jehovah, God, Yahweh, said to my Lord, Yahweh said to Adonai, meaning the Messiah, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And that's exactly where Jesus Christ is presently. Look at verse 44. David, therefore, calls him Lord. How is he then his son? 
So if the Messiah, according to the scriptures, is the son of David, and he absolutely is, the Bible says so, then how can David, inspired by the Spirit of God, write in the book of Psalms and call the Messiah his son? Who's his son? His Lord. How can the Messiah be David's son and David's Lord at the same time? It's a very good question. One translation puts it this way. Since David called him Lord, how can he be his son at the same time? Well, very easy. Jesus existed as God eternally before he ever took on form in Mary's womb and was born in Bethlehem. Not a problem if you believe in the virgin birth of Christ, amen? What we have here is the pre-existent God who was David's Lord and God who came and took on human flesh, somehow implanted himself in the, in the womb of a virgin and at a point in time also became the descendant of David, David's son. So we have both the humanity and the deity of Christ represented here. Jesus Christ is God in human flesh. He existed as God before he was born. Now Jesus had just turned the tables on his examiners again. If they disagreed with what David said in Psalm 10, they had just disagreed with God because God inspired David to write Psalm 110. You see that? If they disagreed with David in Psalm 110, then, or if they agreed with David in Psalm 110, then they'd have to admit that the Messiah was also God, God in human flesh, exactly what Jesus had been claiming about himself the entire time. In fact, that's why they wanted to kill him, because he was a man and he claimed to be the son of God, you see. The examiners just became the examined. Now they're having to think, what? What just happened? And now they got a decision, don't they? Either to fall upon the rock and be broken or to have that rock fall upon them. Then, verse 45, in the hearing of all the people, this entire crowd, he said to his disciples, and I love this, it's like he's standing there talking to the religious leadership, then he looks at the disciples and he says, hey, watch out for these guys, okay? I've been telling you about them. There's, there's snakes in the grass, you know? He says, beware of the scribes who desire to walk in long robes. They love the greetings in the marketplace. They love the titles, the best seats in the synagogues. I'm assuming they would walk and everybody would go, oh, the scribes are here. The Pharisees are here. You know, let them have your seat, you know, and the best places at the feast. And then he says, who devour widows houses. They take advantage of the less fortunate amongst their congregations. And for pretense, for appearance sake, they make long prayers. Can you imagine the hypocrisy they hear? These will receive the greater condemnation. In other words, putting this whole chapter together, the stone, the one they've just rejected, it's fallen on them. And they're going to be crushed to powder. Amen? That's what we're talking about. Jesus, the Lamb of God who take, came to take away the sins of the world, had been inspected, scrutinized by the religious leaders of the nation of Israel. Needless to say, he passed the test with flying colors. There's no spot. There's no blemish. There couldn't be because the Passover lamb needed to be without spot and without blesh, uh, blemish. But systematically, the nation of Israel, the whole nation, represented by its religious leaderships, rejected God's messengers you can read about it. Look what they did to Jeremiah. They put the guy in prison. He just was trying to save him from hell. Beginning with the prophets that God sent, they beat them and treated them shamefully and killed them. And they're about to kill now the Son of God, exactly as Jesus said in the parable. And the question becomes for us, what are we going to do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? Who's the Lamb of God? Are we going to accept him or are we going to reject him? That's the only alternative. If we fall upon him and repent of our sins and come to Christ, we'll be broken. I tell you what, it, 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 we need to be. It's a wonderful place to fall upon Jesus Christ. Here I am, forgive me. But if we reject him, then he will grind us to powder. It, it's pretty serious, isn't it? It's a pretty serious thing. A lot to think about. Well, at this time, we're going to have communion. Our worship team is going to come. They're going to lead us in a song of worship as the ushers come and they pass out the communion. And 
And would you please hold on to that? We're going to take that together. Hold on to the, to the, uh, the bread and hold on to the cup, and then we'll take that together. And, of course, communion is a time which we think about, we reflect on what Jesus Christ, our Lord, uh, has done uh, for us.